This episode is brought to you by PentesterAcademy.com, the leader in online cybersecurity education. Also brought to you by Hacker Arsenal, artillery for cyber warriors. Be sure to check out our latest attack defense gadgets on HackerArsenal.com. Hey, everyone. I'm sitting down here with Andrew Zonenberg today. Thank you so much for being with us. I appreciate it. Thank you. So is this your first time at Hardware.io? Yes, it is. Oh, okay. Nice. So what do you what do you think of it so far? How's it going? Uh, I like it as kind of the same uh, smaller conference feel as Recon. Something like DEF CON is a little big. It can be hard to actually go meet speakers after the fact and so on. And uh, this is a little more my size. Nice. Okay. And so what do you do for a living? I'm a senior security consultant at IOActive. Okay, and so can you tell me a little bit more about your job or walk me through like a typical day? What does that look like for you? A uh, typical day, somebody puts a piece of embedded hardware on my desk and I try and break it. And uh, what it is depends on the customer. Obviously, I can't mention specific names, but uh, we work in uh, industrial control systems, medical stuff, automotive, pretty much at least the stuff I've tended to work on has been it gets owned, somebody dies. Oh, okay. Very interesting. And just out of curiosity, what made you get interested in the cybersecurity field in the first place? Uh, honestly, I can't even remember. I've been doing crypto and low-level stuff for as long as I can remember. Uh, I started doing assembly language to accelerate a game engine I was writing in high school. Uh, I've been doing C since I was nine years old. So, uh, yeah, I'm not entirely sure when I particularly got into security, but it, it's, it's been a while. It's been a hobby for a long time, then okay. Um, so what's, what do you find the most interesting aspect about your job? Like, what do you, what do you love about doing it? Uh, reverse engineering is always fun. I mean, I can do code audits. I don't enjoy them as much as the reverse thing. It's, it's also fun when you do finally break something and you get the pop shell on something that you didn't think you were going to be able to get into or that the customer didn't think you were going to. Okay. Nice. And, um, you know, given your years of experience, what uh, what would you say is one of the biggest growing threats in cybersecurity in today's age? Uh, I would say probably the Internet of Things or, as we like to say in the lab, the Internet of Targets. Mm. There's so much stuff out there that is cobbled together by people who are trying to ship a product quickly and don't necessarily consider that when you put a computer in something that interacts with the real world, there are now physical consequences to getting breached. These things often are made by startups with short lifetimes. There's nobody patching them after the fact. Uh, the, even if the company stays around, there's often not much of a support life cycle. They just expect you to go throw it away in a couple of years and buy a new one. And so a lot of these things are just running hopelessly out of date software. And they're not doing auditing internally. There's so many of them. It's hard for external pen testers to look at them. I see. And what, why, why do you think that this is the case with so many companies that it's always an after the fact kind of a thing, you know? Yeah, it's a good question. And uh, unfortunately, I can't really speak to the business side of things. I find bugs and it's up to somebody else to figure it out. <laughs> so hopefully maybe even integrating that process in, uh, in building the component in the first place, because it seems that a lot of uh, medical devices lately, you know, those IoT medical devices are becoming an issue with getting hacked, it seems like, right? Yeah, and uh, we are actually trying to do things like this as much as possible. Typically what happens is when we work with a new customer, we start out by doing reactive stuff and we're fixing the bugs they already have in what they're shipping and helping them try and mitigate the existing risks. And then as their security posture improves, we start getting to more of a preemptive approach and uh, we try to integrate with their development flow and do testing of pre-release products. And in some cases, we'll even sit in during design meetings and uh, try and... Uh, ensure that security is baked into the design from the start because it's a lot cheaper to make a decision differently early on in the process than it is to clean up the mess after you've made a bad decision. Now you have to live with it or fix it in all of your shipping hardware, et cetera. Absolutely, yeah. And so, so you've probably done a lot. What would you say is one of your proudest moments or biggest accomplishments working in the field overall? Um, it's hard to say, and obviously most of the really fun stuff is client-related and I can't talk about. Totally. Um, the one thing I will say is uh, I did take a certain uh, sick sense of joy in uh, defeating the uh, Simply Safe burglar alarm uh, two years ago, I believe it was. It was a 
sort of IoT-ish burger alarm that was wireless. All the individual components just talked over clear text radio interface. There was no encryption, no replay prevention. Initially, I found that it was possible to replay authentication packets. With a little help from Mike Osman, I managed to reverse engineer the whole protocol, and it was completely wide open and not even really any security to speak of. And so though it wasn't particularly technically challenging from an exploitation perspective, it was marketed as a security product. And uh, so it was interesting to see a lot of these products that are advertised as providing security are not as secure as you would hope. That's a little bit scary to think about sometimes, isn't it? Yeah, and uh, they're not the only ones. And physical security, obviously, is not the only thing. If you look at some of the bugs that Tavis and company have found in antiviruses, those are a big thing as well. Yeah, especially like, I mean, even nowadays, it seems like even the average person with the, what, the Equifax leak and everything. And last week, I believe, what, North Korea um, was just hacked into Bitcoin. So it seems like it's really getting integrated into our everyday, you know, living. Yeah, uh, one of the issues is that uh, there are, it is difficult to enforce consequences in some cases. So if it's a company's own internal data being breached, they're usually going to care. If their, if their product plans get leaked or if you know, their upcoming movie gets leaked or something like that, they're going to care and they're going to take steps to prevent it from happening again if they didn't prevent it from happening in the first place. If it's somebody else's data, it's a little bit harder to, uh, they don't care quite as much about somebody else's data. And uh, so uh, I am curious to see if there will be any uh, regulatory solutions to this down the road. I am not really a politics or management person, so I can't speak to whether it will work, but I can say what's happening now isn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, would you say that there's like a bit of a gap in terms of the need for, you know, more cybersecurity professionals in the industry or is it lacking, would you say? I'm not sure about the entire industry. I can say uh, at the lab I work at specifically in embedded systems, we are aggressively hiring and we are having a hard time finding enough people to meet our demands. As far as non-hardware people, it's not really my department, so I can't speak to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, you know, what would you say is one of the biggest uh, growing threats in cybersecurity today? Hmm... Out of all, I know, I know there's a lot of concerning ones out there, but, you know, just given all of your experience in the field and, you know, years of work, you know, what, what, what do you find to be one of the most concerning, I guess? Uh, again, I guess I would have to fall back on the IoT and just the general trend of adding communications capabilities to more and more things without particularly paying as much thought as they should to the consequences of it. And we're starting to see this again in things like driver assistance for vehicles and so on. There's more and more intelligence in things that can do more and more physical harm. And in many cases, the security aspect of this is being somewhat neglected. And uh, what do you what what are your thoughts on the self driving models? I know lately, you know, in California, you see a Tesla almost in every other car. So what what do you think about that? I'm curious. Uh, I'm just gonna say I drive a bicycle to work. Nice. So you're you'd fit in with the Amsterdam culture pretty well then, actually. <laughs> Uh, yes, I was actually very impressed with the uh, bike friendliness of the city, and uh, I half wish I'd brought my bike. <laughs> Same. Me too. I'm not going to lie. I wish California was like that. Well, thank you so much, Andrew. I really appreciate you sitting down with us. Thank you. Thank you. This episode was brought to you by Pen Tester Academy, the leader in online cybersecurity education. Also brought to you by Hacker Arsenal, artillery for cyber warriors. Visit us on HackerArsenal.com to check out our latest attack defense gadgets.